Hello, neighbor. I'm so glad you're here. Just a few notes about life together in the neighborhood. A reminder that this October we're participating in It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, a sermon series with the spiritual wisdom of Fred Rogers. So thanks for joining us and hearing what's up in the neighborhood of American Lutheran Church. Thanks, first of all, to everyone that participated in all of our events this past week. Those that attended our uh, Wednesday night meeting with William B. Henry to learn about issues of diversity in our community and to educate ourselves on what terms and uh, conversations are happening, not only in buildings, but in a larger scale around issues of race and diversity. We're excited this coming Wednesday night to have Bridger Care out of Bozeman coming to teach us an ally training, helping us understand those uh, same ideas of terms and conversations around LGBTQIA inclusion and how we can be a great neighbor to our friends that identify in those ways. So if you are uh, interested in that training, be sure to give the uh, church office a call. Today in worship, if you're here at American Lutheran Church, during our Won't You Be My Neighbor series, you'll hear from our neighbor Kristen Rapaz sharing about how her work with people that are experiencing uh, houselessness uh, are going through um, different needs in our community and how she's touching them by her barbershop and beauty shop expertise. In our forum this Sunday, we are also hearing from Cliff and Dorothy Holland. Cliff and Dorothy were longtime members of American Lutheran Church. Their son was raised here in our congregation and has gone on to a life of ordained ministry, but not without a few bumps on the path because of the ELCA's policy on allowing uh, partnered gay and lesbian pastors. Now that that uh, rule has changed, Eric Holland has gone on to serve his congregation um, for over a decade. But they're sharing some of the story and how American Lutheran was helpful in making sure that he found that path to ministry. In our prayers today, we continue to pray for Ted Rist and for Elaine. Uh, if you remember last week, Ted was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and they've made decisions this week about how to uh, have a path forward for them and their life together. So prayers for Ted and Elaine. We welcome all who are listening on the radio. Today's broadcast is sponsored by Marion Eichlin in honor of Jeff and Sidney DeBusk's anniversary. Let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We continue with our opening litany. God calls us to be together as neighbors in faith, to celebrate those who came before us, to be in community with those around us, and to care for those who will come after us. With joy and thanksgiving, let us be good neighbors. With joy and thanksgiving, let us praise the Lord. We continue with confession and forgiveness. Merciful Lord, we confess to a dire lack of love for our neighbor, our enemy, and even especially ourselves. We confess that we fail to love as you have taught. Give us eyes that see your image in each of your children. Grant us hearts that love others, not as that we wish they were, but as you have made them to be. For the ways we harmed our neighbors with our action and inaction, we repent. For the good we have failed to do, forgive us. And for the desire to do better, strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Friends, God is a God of hope, facing the future with a vision of what can be. We have been forgiven and set free to trust in God's promises and in God's steadfast, faithful, and unwavering love for us. Let us turn now to the world and share the good we, news we know. God is love. Amen. We sing now our opening hymn, number 660, Lift High the Cross.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, in Jesus washing the disciples' feet, we see your call to humility. Help us all to be humble, to, rent, to, to surrender ourselves, our privilege, and our desires for the sake of the other. In Jesus' name, amen. We now hear our song of praise, Jesus, name above all names. A reading from Psalm 25. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth, and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. And teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his decree. Our second reading is from Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be. <laughs> The Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. 
And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. It's called recency bias. Recency bias. The temptation to think that, all, that our time in history is either the best or the worst, whatever the case might be, of any time in history. At an event at Billings Clinic a few years ago, Marcia and I had the privilege of hearing Tom Brokaw, the newscaster who's retired now. He was taking questions, and someone asked him that with all of our differences surrounding COVID, with racial strife going on, with the behavior of police officers in question, with our political differences, if this is the worst time he's ever seen in American history. Oh no, he quickly replied. That would be 1968. And 1968 takes us right to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. When Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood aired first in 1968 on a public television station in Pittsburgh, it was a time when American viewers were desperate for some good news. The previous decade had brought political assassinations. John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr. Had to, and there was also the Cold War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War. And television, television relatively new and being almost in every home at that time, had delivered all of it right into America's dens and family rooms. With this new technology in place, no, safe, no place was safe from chaos and turmoil. No place was simply over there. Every place was near. Every threat, local. Every conflict, personal. In many ways, television shaped and escalated the conflicts of the 1960s in the same way the internet shapes and escalates conflicts of today, simultane simultaneously expanding and shrinking our sense of community. So over the course of 31 years and 865 episodes, Rogers would use his neighborhood to show the world as it should be. A microcosm of kindness where neighbors love and support each other through difficult times of death and divorce and danger. It was also a space where Rogers helped viewers confront their own fears and prejudices, leading them in his own non-threatening way. From the beginning, Rogers specifically challenged the nation's understanding of race through friendship, both on and off screen, friendship with Francois Clemens, the neighborhood police officer who just happened to be African American. Born in Birmingham, Alabama, Francois Clemens was the descendant of slaves and sharecroppers, but like many other blacks, his family moved to the industrial Midwest and he grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. Clemens, however, remained deeply connected through his roots, both through the spirituals that his mother taught him and by cultivating his growing vocal talent in church. Eventually, Clemens pursued a career as an opera singer and Rogers heard him sing at his home congregation in Pittsburgh. Soon after hearing him, Rogers invited Clemens to appear in his neighborhood as a police officer. Fred came to me, Clemens say, said in an interview, and said, I have this idea, you could be a police officer. That kind of stopped me in my tracks. 
I grew up in the ghetto, Clemens said. I didn't have a positive opinion of police officers. Policemen were sicking police dogs and water hoses on people. And I really had a hard time putting myself in that role. So I was not at all excited about being a police officer. But Rogers prevailed. And Clemens joined Mr. Rogers' neighborhood in August 1968, only four months after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. In doing so, Clemens became the first African-American with a recurring role in a children's television series. Think about that, 1968. That's only, that's, what is it, 32, and it's only uh, 55 years ago, 55 years ago, the first African-American with a recurring role in a children's television series. But as progressive as this was, Rogers decided to press social convention even further. In this episode, which aired only a few months after Clemens' debut, it, it opens in a typical manner with Rogers inviting viewers to be his neighbor. But instead of putting on his iconic cardigan, you might notice I don't have a cardigan on today. That's delayed in shipping, so I've got this red sweater on, my Mr. Rogers sweater for today anyway. Rogers talk, instead of putting on a sweater, Rogers talks about how hot the day is, how nice it would be to put his feet into a pool of cold water. He then moves to his front yard where he fills a small plastic pool with water and begins to soak his feet. Well, soon Officer Clemens drops by and Mr. Rogers invites him to share his pool with him. Clemens quickly accepts, rolls up his pant legs and puts his very brown feet into the same pool as Mr. Rogers' very white feet. Now, part of our capital campaign is to have screens in our sanctuary off to the sides, either side in the front. Think how nice it would be if I could show you that clip at this time during the sermon. You'll have to watch it in the weekly email. Today, this very small gesture might seem insignificant, but in 1968, it was considerable. Like public fountains, public transportation, public schools, the public pool had become a battleground for race relations, for segregation. So I was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1961, not because my family was at all from that area, or they're all from Minnesota like I am, but because dad was going to graduate school then. Six months after I was born in Richmond, we moved back to the upper Midwest. So I once asked dad what it felt like to live in Richmond then. He quickly answered, it felt segregated, very segregated. Drinking fountains, not only pools, but drinking fountains, public places were segregated places. By 1968, things had changed some, but not a lot. In Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, quiet Presbyterian minister and an African-American police officer show the world how to integrate swimming pools. They model another way of living, a way of living of loving your neighbor, of loving your neighbor with humility and service. Rogers invites, Clemens accepts. And as Clemens slips his feet into the pool, the camera holds the shot for several seconds, as if to make the point clear. A pair of brown feet and a pair of white feet can indeed share the same swimming pool. Nearly 25 years later, Rogers and Clemens reenact the moment. They do that 25 years after this. Much older Rogers and Clemens sit with their feet in a similar blue wading pool, and they talk about different ways children and adults say, I love you, from singing to cleaning up a room to drawing a picture for someone, to making a play. As the scene ends, Rogers takes a towel and helps Clemens dry his feet with a simple, here, let me help you. It's a scene that takes us to our gospel reading from the Gospel of John, when Jesus wraps a towel around his waist and washes the disciples' feet, a humbling act of serving others. After Jesus sits down, he says to them, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to do it to one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This foot washing was originally done on Thursday, the Thursday before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. We know that day as Maundy Thursday, the Maundy in that title coming from the Latin word mandatum, meaning commandment, referring to Jesus commanding his disciples to practice the same love and service toward others that he had shown them. But foot washing is more. It's more than an act of humility and service. In many ways, it's also an act of cleansing and repentance. Throughout the scriptures, washing and water symbolize the purification from sin and disease and brokenness. 
from the ceremonial washing of the Old Testament to the waters of baptism. So even within the context of the Last Supper, Jesus was washing the disciples' feet of all the grime they had accumulated on the dirty streets of Jerusalem. And when Peter objected to Jesus' act of humility, Jesus said to him, if I do not wash you, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Perhaps this image of Jesus as servant cleanser was in the Apostle Paul's mind when he wrote that passage that we heard from Philippians. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of humanity, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It's no surprise then that when a Presbyterian minister wanted to heal the divide between blacks and whites to show us how to humble ourselves and serve each other, it looked very much like Jesus' own servanthood. And when Roger shared his pool and wiped his friend's feet with a towel, he was repenting through servanthood, the same servanthood that motivated Jesus to take up the towel the night before his death. But both acts require humility. Both acts require relinquishing privilege, the privilege of anger on Clement's part, the privilege of comfort on Roger's part. And through this humility, both men embody Christ, neither condescending to the other, both simply surrendering to the other. So in that very same act, the humiliated are brought up and the proud are brought down. In one brief scene on a children's television show, we see this happen. We see two men humbling themselves. We see two men cleansing each other through acts of communion and identification. We see two men showing the world how reconciliation happens. And we hear Mr. Rogers say in his own quiet voice, sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. Sometimes just a minute like this will really make a difference. So we are all called to take a minute and to make a difference to reach out to someone unlike us, someone with a disability, someone with a different sexual orientation, someone with a different skin color, to reach out and to make them feel and know the welcome of Jesus. Amen. We now hear our hymn of the day, Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. God who calls us, call us together with all our neighbors to do the work of love and peace in our world. May we humble ourselves so that we can serve those in need. Embolden us so we can see where we need to grow. And grant us your peace so that we may share it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God who makes us brave, lift up leaders in our world, nation, state, community, and church, that some will step into the role of cheerleader and change maker. May these leaders work for the good of all and break us free from selfish ways so that our community may thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who is our home, we pray for those in our community without food stability and a place to call home. We pray for the teens served by tumbleweed, the households that lean on family service, and the elders who need more care. For all ages, that the place they rest their heads is safe, their sleep restorative, and that they can wake each day with hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who is our future, we pray for those who don't know the path before them, for those that are lost due to illness or addiction, due to things of their own choosing or the reality of our broken world. For all who need help for the next step, we pray, especially for Ted Rist and Elaine, for all on our prayer list, and for those we name now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who loves each one of us, we pray for those who feel connected and those who feel on the fringe. Knowing we can't read the hearts of others, let us work until all are welcome, accepted, and loved just as they are. May your love drop the walls that divide and, the sil and silence the words that hurt. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love, O God, as we offer these in the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion made known through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray now the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may God, who knows our hearts, comfort you in what weighs you down. May Christ, who challenges us, open our eyes to our neighbors. And may the Spirit that guides our days call us to be courageous and vulnerable all at once. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our setting song, Make Me a Servant.
And now go in peace and be a neighbor to all. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.